Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adrake Bodunde, and I am a member of the research crew for the Tony Falala interviews. The TF interviews is a series of discussions that aim to amplify the diverse voices of Africa and the African diaspora. In order to fully participate in the present, we must first understand the past. Our goal with this series is to use history and historical analysis to contextualize today's events. This series aims to tackle topics and issues that affect Africans by engaging in conversation with key figures and experts in the realm of African affairs. We hope that in doing this, we will inspire and ignite vibrant discussion amongst young Africans. Our host is Dr. Tony Falola, renowned historian and scholar of African history at the University of Texas at Austin. Today, we are joined by the former president of Ghana, His Excellency, President John Kufo. We hope that you enjoy and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for being here with us today. It's a great honor for me to moderate this conversation with you and our co-hosts. And thank you, all our viewers. We've pushed more viewers to YouTube and other sites. Um, we thank you for coming and we we'll also like to commend the hard work of our team members, young students and scholars, IT people based in Africa and here. I want to be, we want to begin with questions from Professor Onwusu Ansa, uh, who does not require an introduction, a distinguished Ghanaian scholar is a professor of African history, associate provost for diversity and executive director for faculty access and inclusion at James Madison University, Arizimburg, Virginia. He holds a doctorate degree from Northwestern University, a master's degree in Islamic studies from McGill and it's um, a Ghanaian product he graduated from the University of Cape Coast uh, with a bachelor's degree in comparative religions and education. He's had many distinguished appointments, a former fellow of the Ari Truman Institute for International Peace at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's also served as editorial board member of so many journals. He's past president of the Ghana Studies Association which is an affiliate organization of the International African Studies Association. It's published so many books, remarkably three editions of the Historical Dictionary of Ghana. And he recently co-authored Islamic Learning, the State and the Challenges of Education. Thank you, Professor. Kindly post your questions to His Excellency. Good morning, everyone. And good morning and uh, good day, His Excellency. Um, 10 years ago, I had a conversation with you. And um, we were talking about all the great accomplishments that your government made for the two terms uh, in office. Um, you committed Ghana to the highly indebted poor country project, a HIPIC, uh, for economic uh, austerities and recovery. And then, of course, um, you, it was under your administration that uh, Ghana uh, had its own, uh, first uh, significant oil production. And yet, uh, in 19, uh, 2007 and 2008, we have the international economic crisis. Uh, and when I talked to you two years after that, 2010, you made the point that had the crisis not occurred, you could have achieved more. And in fact, you made the point also that uh, a five-year term for the presidency could have actually made it possible for some of these things to be done. Uh, are you still committed to the idea that a five-year 
term presidency in Ghana uh, is something to consider. And uh, I also put the question uh, in this way, was that a good idea? And um, over time, do you consider those who opposed an idea of a five-year term uh, a reasonable opposition? You didn't hear us, apparently. I think he has to unmute. He's not unmuted. Okay. Yeah, we got you now. They haven't. They told me that they are having internet challenges. But we can hear his voice. Maybe he can call in with a phone. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I apologize for the inconvenience. We are trying to get this sorted. Um, the internet connection is unstable, so we are calling in on the phone. Why we're waiting for them? Can we talk about? Um, um, sir, you are good to go. Is good to go. Did, did he hear the question? Mm -hmm. Oh. Hello, Mr. President. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're yes, I hear you all right. Yes. So good morning to all. Is it good afternoon over there? Good, um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, uh, I'm happy to be seeing all of you. Unfortunately, I can't hear you from the laptop. Um, so I'm ready to talk with you. And uh, it's going to be interactive. 
I hope. Because uh, I, I got a message that you wanted to uh, sort of find out for me uh, uh, about my perspectives of power management in Ghana, especially during my tenure as president, and of course uh, around uh, our continent. So I believe the ball is in your court. Okay, sir. All right, uh, Mr. President, good morning. Oh, good afternoon. I bid. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I I asked uh, the first question about your view of a five-year term for presidency uh, in Ghana, uh, because when we talked ten years ago, yes. um, you were a little bit concerned that many of the things that your administration wanted to accomplish uh, was interrupted by the economic crisis of 2007, 2008. And that if there was a five year term, especially for two terms that you served, you could have accomplished more. And my question is that, do you still believe that a five year term presidency in Ghana is a good idea? Uh, I I believe it is a good idea. I believe in term offices as a principle, yes, terms. But uh, I should take into account the stage of development and uh, also the stage of uh, the economic and social challenges that a new government introduced into power to tackle. Um, you would remember 2001 when I entered power, my government came into office, that the economy was truly highly indebted, both domestically and internationally. And it was what forced us to take the hippie initiative. Uh, most of my government, and I'm talking of the ministers and the new office holders, hadn't had any experience of government. And uh, the reality is that when a new government comes into office, first it must saddle itself in government. When I say that, I mean the political leadership must sort of come in and try to harness the civil service, which is full of very experienced and highly professional and highly trained civil servants. They tend to be faceless and uh, presumably also uh, partyless. They are neutral. They, that's the assumption, even though in reality, they all have their uh, sentiments and attachments. So when uh, such a new team of politicians come to manage uh, uh, the uh, dormant latent force, which is the civil service, the civil service trained with more or less specialized eye, tries quickly to assess the new master that has come in as minister. And I tell you, they tend to mark the politician perhaps more strictly than you professors would mark uh, your students. And if they do not get encouraged quickly that the guy that has come in as minister knows what he's about, I tell you the first year, Into the second year, of course, the minister, the politician that has come in, whose party has come in with a manifesto, will try to get the civil service to help him or her to cobble together a policy that would then be taken to cabinet for cabinet to approve and then on to parliament for uh, legislation and that sort of thing. Uh, it's not an easy task at all. And it's into the second year that the politics really. Uh, be, if they are passed by parliament, we, we have to see the light of day. I hope you are hearing me. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes, please. Yes. So, first year goes without much achievement in terms of real and practical government 
policies and uh, uh, realization and implementation. Into the second year, uh, yes, the ministers averagely. Then ministers will then be sort of maturing and finding their feet. Uh, into the third year, the, the policies into acts and giving budgets will become, uh, will begin to impact on the um, on the uh, nation, the landscape. Before any impact is made at the grassroots. You are in the fourth year. Fourth year is election year. And everywhere, including America, election years tend to be crazy. So you can imagine in a, a developing country and a poor one attacks. Swiss, you have five ministers at the desks trying to do anything. And the civil servants also tend to go easy. It's that you tend to experience bureaucracy in its worst steps. So fourth year don't tend to be productive and it's election year. So my point is, why do we as a developing country in practical terms to get our policies and laws on the ground to try to better the lot of our people. So I thought it would at least add another year so that by the third, fourth years, a government, if it would, would be fed by the people. The people generally would begin to say, yes, this is a good government we've given ourselves. But into the fifth year, when it's election year, we allow the praise of campaigning and traveling around and that sort of thing. The people would have assessed the government appropriately. If the government has proved itself, the people would have the right to give such a government a second term. If the people by the fourth year, end of it, are not convinced that this is a government that they should give a second tenure to, they just go to, go to town. So this is my argument. And it holds not just for, say, me. And my government, I like, it should apply in the developing world generally to five year terms. Basically, the first five year, let the government establish itself by which time, if the really government is truly competent, it would have had the civil servants or civil service under its uh, is it big to work for it efficiently. Okay, Mr. President. I'm afraid. It's a local system of government prescribed. I subscribe to. So this is why I asked for a term for a developing country. It's two shots. All right. Uh, my, <laughs> my quick follow up then is um, there are folks who believe that you no, know, you have a five year term in the Cote d'Ivoire and some of these other places, and it leads to governments that become. <laughs> The line is breaking. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, Professor, and, and I apologize, Your Excellency. Please, would you, please, would you like to try? The line is breaking. I can't hear you. Okay, this is, um, Your Excellency, please, would you like to try um calling directly into the call, because I believe that might. Might the laptop again? Okay? Um, sorry, Your Excellency. Well, I was asking whether Prof had heard me. Yes, I did. I did hear you, sir. Uh, Five-year term being perhaps more uh, appropriate for developing countries. Yes. Four-year term. I did four hear you, sir. For uh, uh, government members who are new to the job, uh, they are facing poor economies and uh, many myriads of uh, social uh, development challenges. I believe tends to be two shots. So I would add another year to make it five years. And if the government is even average, by the end of four years, people will be convinced that uh, they should give such a government 
Yes, I, I heard you. Thank you very much. Are you um, concerned that some uh, opposition may see this as a way for the government to entrench itself in power? Uh, that I, has I been the know if, Ladies and gentlemen, you fed me. Yes. Have you heard me? Yes, we heard you. Oh, I, we can't hear you on our end here. Okay, sure. So what do we do? Bafo, we hear, we hear him. So let him know that we do hear him. Okay. So we, we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Yes. Okay, we can we can the microphone. Shall we continue? Yeah, continue. Hello, Your Excellency. Please, um, can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. So now you hear me, Prof. Yes, we heard everything you said before. So can I continue, please? It's unfortunate. The reception where I am is not good. Because I still cannot hear you. You still cannot hear us. No, I mean, now you are coming across very faintly. Okay, so, so you can work very good. So let me follow up to the first question. We had your answer to the first question. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was um, trying to follow up that because the people that are usually opposed to a five year term take a look at the Ivory Coast Cote d'Ivoire and some African countries that have five-year terms. And they believe that a five-year term- uh, yes. We should always factor in our human nature. Okay. I assume that uh, presidents and governments sworn on the constitutions of the nation would respect their constitutions. That's an assumption we should make. So that if the human factor is taken into account, that there are people who, because uh, is it over ambition or power drunkenness, would want to tamper with their constitution, then even if you give them a 10-year term, when the term is up, they might want to uh, sort of uh, tamper with constitution and change it. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm coming from uh, the, the perspective of the average politician who has been elected into office in a developing country of uh, economic and social challenges uh, going to work with a civil service that tends to be uh, rather uh, suspecting of political bosses. And that wouldn't readily yield to cooperating with the political boss, the new political boss. Uh, the first year, becomes fun of sizing up and uh, it doesn't tend to produce much in terms of policies and then working with uh, the legislature from the executive end to get bills done and to get budgets worked out properly. And for that, I would use the first two year uh, period of such a term, if you are talking four years, for the ministers to find their feet and settle in. And if they are competent, it will be in the third year you see their policies coming up. 
Uh, to the fourth year, it's normal in politics, as I said, even in the United States, you should know it. Everybody goes crazy in politics. <laughs> and uh, you won't find our ministers sitting in their uh, ministries or even in cabinet, focusing on sort of working out and implementing their programs well because they want to be returned to power. So let's use first two for ministry, ministers and uh, political appointees to settle in and then allow two years for them to show their competence. And fifth year, let them politic to regain their uh, power. So five years to me, and that's for, as I said, uh, the average person that would affect the national constitution. So where in other places, constitutionally, they have five-year terms, but for whatever reason, towards the end of term, you get some people playing smart with the constitution and wanting to amend. That's not what I have in the case. Okay, so now let me go to my second question then, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the qu second question is, um, when you left office, you were very, very, very busy in your immediate post-presidency. You work with the World Food Project. You work with the World Bank in so many capacities. You serve on foundations. And I know that you traveled a lot. Now that you have been out of office for some time and you are not traveling that much, certainly we are interested in the strength of political institutions uh, in Ghana. And I want to see what you think is your new role for your party and for the country. What do you see your new role to be? You're talking of my new role within my party. Your party and the country, what do you see yourself as contributing in those particular uh, circumstances? Well, um, I would say that uh, in a way, when you look at the Ghana situation historically, it was my regime that um, really uh, gave my party the first chance, real chance, lasting two terms to serve in government. And when I say look rhetorically at Ghana's uh, uh, scene, you know independence was 57. Mm -hmm. From 57 till um, I came to power 2000, uh, one, 2001 is when I started. My party as such had had only two years, three months, and that was 69 September to January 72. That was under Professor Buzia to, to uh, try to uh, govern. Two years, three months then, I uh, saw the uh, military coup under General Achampo. And from 72 January till I came to power 2001, almost 30 years ago, my party hadn't had any chance at all to be government in Ghana. So I came in like uh, the debris. We came in as first timers. In a, that sense, we were like uh, uh, pioneers, my government. And we served so well on the principles we call Dankobuzia, the principles that have been uh, uh, envisioned from as far back as 1947 of uh, rule of law, respect for human rights, respect the private sector and private initiatives, govern democratically, uh, allowing people freedom of expression, and uh, also of choice. And that was what my government tried to do. We felt we had a duty, my government felt we had a duty to prove to uh, the nation that democracy truly worked, even though very challenging, would be the best means to give the dividends to the people at large, inclusively, uh, without uh, uh, rights being tampered with under the pretext of strong men or whatever. So this was what, and if you remember, it was part of the manifesto that we came to power with. 
that my government would usher in the golden age of business to really create the wealth without which any talk of uh, social interventions, uh, infrastructure development, and so forth and so on, opening up the country uh, would work. So this is how we came in. And when we came in, we tried to work these value systems or philosophies, if you like ideology, the people say we were liberal democrats, and also some styled us as capitalists, in inverted commas, the wrong sense of capitalism. But till now, I don't think there has been any government that has really achieved social interventions to benefit the people inclusively. Like uh, within the short space of my government, six years, we moved the country from highly indebted poor country to middle income status. The per capita income in 2001 was uh, about three, four hundred US dollars, GCP. By the time we were stepping out, in fact, by 2006, in record time, the per capita income had jumped to 1,300 US dollars. That's what got us uh, styled as middle income and the first in the sub saharan uh, part of uh, Africa, except South Africa. And then we followed up by liberalizing across, um, uh, licensing banks, of course, properly uh, assessed from our central bank, uh, encouraging uh, agriculture, cocoa farmers, changing the ratio of sharing of the international market price with the government taking the lesser and giving the farmer who had taken the initiative to do his farms, acquire the land and all that, to make Ghana the number one producer of cocoa beans within uh, say 20 or 30 years from 1920. But by our time, the farmers were so disgruntled, they were cutting down the cocoa trees. And so my government came in, said, no, we are for them, for rural development, change it. So government took the 30% or so and allowed the farmers 60%. And within three years, the farmers went back to their farms and the produce jumped from 350,000 tons in 2001 to about 2005, over 700,000 tons, all time record in the history of cocoa production. And as you know, cocoa has been the lifeblood of the economy of Ghana, even till now. It's still the biggest or so contributor to the, the um, economy. And it wasn't only that we introduced the free compulsory universal basic education, which is, was the foundation for what the current government, which is a continuation of mine, is trying to do free senior high school for all the children of Ghana at the expense of the state, and it's working. And then national health insurance scheme. When we came on the scene, it was uh, the, it wasn't a policy, but the situation was so bad that people dubbed it cash and carry. Meaning, if you didn't have money and you fell ill, then you were like condemned to die. So we said, no, let's get a national insurance policy, which we did. And now it's what people are talking about. We even included in that free maternity care. Because that time, for every thousand uh, pregnant women, almost a hundred were big enough. And then high infant mortality. But with that introduction, we saw, uh, uh, if you like, an abatement of the sad incidents. And people were happy. We achieved all these without uh, denying anybody their uh, civic and constitutional human rights. So that was what led to Ghanaian professionals who were uh, more or less uh, gone off to places like the United States, uh, doctors, engineers. They started coming back. And then investments uh, were also being attracted back. And then internationally, that was what gave me the, the stature to be invited by UN and other institutions. For instance, I got invited to the G7 G8 meetings for about three consecutive years in the United States, uh, is it Sea Islands or so in the South, uh, in the uh, Germany, uh, in Glen Eagles in Britain. Everywhere the big countries were meeting, they invited me. And it was because of the way. And then I think it was also uh, with this background that the, on the continent of Africa itself, in my second year, 
I got invited by the ECOWAS, Economic Community of West African States, to chair it. Now, they selected me or elected me in Dakar, not in Accra. I had gone, not knowing, but my colleagues, my peers of West Africa, approached me and said, I should serve as their chairman. And I did it for consecutive terms, two years. And it was during those times, too, uh, because our foreign policy of uh, good neighborliness, well, we helped with the restoration of peace in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Cote d'Ivoire, our next door neighbor. Uh, Togo, we helped him. Uh, then I got to like Kenya. I was the person who set up the Kofi Annan panel of Africa to help resolve the Kenyan uh, troubles in 2007, 2008. I don't remember. So we did, I did all these things in the spirit and purpose of the Dankwa Bugia philosophy and tradition. Yes, they say capitalism because we favored the private sector to generate the wealth, but we didn't support them to uh, sort of uh, practice unconscionable uh, business. So we say, yes, we are capitalists with a conscience. We had a high sense of responsibility. We want to generate the wealth, but for the government to glean a fair share of uh, whatever profit to apply to opening up the country with modern uh, infrastructure, uh, with good governance, uh, policing, uh, law and order, uh, sustaining the judicial system, uh, and that sort of thing. And then we also created the Ministry of Private Sector Development. Later, we saw that to get the public sector to appreciate that you should play the, uh, if you like, the infrastructure for freeing the private sector, we set up also the public sector reform uh, ministry on the move. And just the beginnings of public-private partnership, which is now the partner everywhere. The two sides must work together. Thank you. Thank you on that, Mr. President. Without which, um, attention to make us any So, and three things since I left the state, I was expecting uh, that. Uh, for the good works of those times, 2001 to 2008, Ghana would give us um, this, my party, the not to continue, unfortunately, for the, the several reasons that we didn't get the votes in 2000. There was a swing to our, uh, the other side. The other side, after just a year, returned to the IMF tutely sent us back. And naturally, IMF imposed conditionalities, depriving governments of the right to negotiate uh, credit lines to continue opening up the economy. Uh, the infrastructure we had started, like roads, opening up the country, got stopped. The housing scheme that we launched got stopped. The social intentions and unfortunately, that side describes itself as the uh, social democrats in the left of the people. They didn't do much for social intervention for the next eight years. And this was why the current government, the closest to change, was returned with a landslide majority against the incumbent government then. Mr. The President, government um, would you? The mold in which I was cast. And uh, trying to do what uh, I did. Um, of course, there's always the human factor. You can't get it. Thank you, sir. That's like perfection. But on balance, I believe uh, we're trying to do first of following in the steps of our tradition. Can I can I ask a last question from me? And so yes. I can yeah. The last question from me. Um, is can you talk about the foundation, uh, the Kufo Foundation, how it is continuing yes. your dreams in terms of government? So, brother and friend, Professor Bafo, who is the CEO, I see, I think that he's standing somewhere in the corner of the screen. Yes. Um, the foundation's name is uh, Leadership, 
governance and development. I've come to believe unshakably that without good focus and sincere leadership, uh, you talk transformation, then you are not being sincere or perhaps you do not know what you are about. And how do we do it? I thought when I stepped down that we should seek to imbue our youth, especially in the tertiary level of education, universities, to appreciate the very pivotal role of leadership on our continent. And of course, I start from Ghana. Let the people appreciate. Given the, the wealth of illiteracy and ignorance, which is no fault of our people's history, unfortunately, forced us into that setting. We, I came to believe that every youth that got chance onto a university campus should be made to appreciate that he, he or she is an elite, a privileged group whose responsibility must be to help the mass of our people lift themselves up out of the stark poverty, disease, ignorance. We are sitting on so much wealth. Unfortunately, because of ignorance and poor leadership so far, the, the, the people come from outside the continent to negotiate us out of our natural resources. And even where they generate some employment, is the cramps, cramps, they leave us, but they uh, take off, shovel, shovel off our wealth to the west and to the east and to the north. So, with our immense, immense natural wealth, we are still poor. So we want to let our youth with the privilege of higher education to understand our circumstances, to get to know our, our land, and our people try to understand, know our history, and also get to know geopolitics. The Europeans coming, the Americans coming, the Chinese coming, they are not coming because they love us. They come because they, with their trained eyes, they see the huge advantages. And how would we ever negotiate if leadership is not up to these visitors who come? So negotiating skills. That they are critical for our aspirations and ambitions to, to transform. And where do we get it? It must be from the youth that privilege, as I describe them. So when the foundation, I set it up and got uh, your friend, uh, Professor Bafwadina, to be CEO, we set up a mentoring center. And uh, with our meager resources, unfortunately, Last year, for instance, when they advertised online, I'm not part of the selection thing, I tell you. They advertised, and over 2,000 students applied from about 11 universities across the nation. And how many could we select to mentor? Only 30 of them, 30. As it turned out, of the 30, and they were selected on merit. 16 turned out to be girls, with the boys bringing the year 14. But in spite of this limited thing, the first thing the foundation has become the convention. Once they get recruit, recruited as such and they accept, they are sent back into the country. The middle belt of Ghana, very remote, undeveloped. To go and stay there for two, three weeks with the villagers, see the sort of water they are drinking there, the unpassable roads, the uh, diseases, the poverty, the ignorance, two or three weeks in the darkness, no electricity. So when they come back to their campuses and say, um, Hello everyone, sorry again. I think it seems the president is having um, connection issues again. Whatever I, they are using is working well. 
I can hear everything. I don't know how we can restore. Is it a calling they're using now or what system are they using? So um, they were able to call into the Zoom call normally. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and call on the phone, as in call into the Zoom call on the phone, and we'll try and get that one. Well, they said it's back, only that it's muted. Oh, he is back? Okay, I will find... Somebody sent me a note that it's back, but it's muted. Okay. Can we call them to unmute? Yes. Are you back? Send to their campuses. They should naturally, naturally feel like missionaries who would feel a, a duty to prepare themselves. And we hold them for three years. Go like missionaries to help transform societies to lift the people, lead the people out of these challenges I've tried to describe. And we believe that is this um, change of attitude and appreciation of their, the nation whose name they bear that will also make for good governance, good governance of inclusion. Uh, the tribalism, fight against tribalism, against religion, against gender, they will all become real under the leadership of the, the imbued youth, the missionaries, youth with missionary zeal to try to help to change in whatever field. It may not be politics, if it's engineering, if it's medicine, whatever. We want them to be so seed, to want to do something to better the lives of their people. And then when we've got him such governance and we are talking of development, then it's real. Development would become rounded. But so far, uh, because of this lack of mentor mentorship or mentoring, many a youth on our campuses even when they have come from the rural past to say the uh, comforts of Legon in Accra or Palm and Kuma University of Science and Tech in Kumasi or Cape Coast University, they don't want to go back to the bush. When they finish their courses, they all want to take white collar jobs or travel out of Ghana. So uh, th that's the foundation to mentor the youth, to appreciate the reality of their nations. So that, that, that spirit of sacrifice uh, for people wanting to serve, to uplift their nation. And I'm talking of Ghana, but it applies, I'm sure, across our continent of Africa. So this is what the foundation is about. And we've been doing this for the past is it four or five years. We've had some international people of such, not only from Africa, uh, her scholar of Germany, former German president, who was IMF managing director for some time. Uh, when we assumed office in 2001, he was the managing director of IMF. Uh, in interacting with him, I saw that there was a strong streak of humanity in him, so we became friends. And when I was launching the foundation at Legon, I invited him to come. I invited uh, President Mbeki of South Africa. The two of them came to assist me. Uh, to launch the foundation. Uh, they gave rousing speeches and at that time in Kumasi. Uh, since then, we've had uh, Trevor Manuel of South Africa, as well as uh, Mandela and Becky colleagues. I, I, Ngozi of Nigeria, Ngozi, the finance minister, the lady, they've addressed the issue and other achievers in other fields. They've come to interact with our youth always to full uh, uh, audiences, full halls, uh, to talk. And they, these uh, speakers, they start with how they started themselves to inspire the youth. Uh, this is what we're trying to do. 
uh, we've also in, uh, sent some of them to participate in youth conferences, some to China for the Asian Youth Conference, some to, in Japan, Tokyo. Uh, some are also operating with uh, Clinton Foundation Youth. Uh, some Europe, and everywhere they go, they, they stand out clearly with some distinction. Uh, so this is what the foundation is about, and I hope we'll be able to do more. Uh, the Premier University of Ghana has given the foundation a piece of land on campus, which we are developing into uh, offices and conference centers, and also with an auditorium or, if you like, theater, because we want them to also appreciate culture. Thank you, sir. Um, Obina, is your system working so that they can move to our next person? Yes. Mr. President, can you hear me? They disappear, right? Yes, I will get him back on. Let me apologize to the audience. We've, um, we've, we spoke with them two days ago, yesterday the internet was good. And today the internet decides to change his mind. So I, I call it Juju. <laughs> Continue. Yeah, but let me, sir, I know you are back, but let me use this opportunity to bring the next person, Professor All right. Nana Akwa Aindo, to do All the right. interview. Uh, Nana may not know that his dad, Professor Aindo, is my friend, and his mom, at one time, was my student here at the University of Texas in Austin. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the small world. <laughs> I probably saw you when you were young living with him. Uh, he's, he's an associate professor and director of the Center for Social Policy Studies at the University of Ghana. Our research examines the ways in which marginalized social groups, the young people that the professor spoke about and women how they respond to globalization, neoliberalization, and how they can use their knowledge to transform Ghana along some of the ways that His Excellency is talking about. And we are grateful that she finished her degree and went back home to contribute to transformation. Um, Almost one third of the Ghanaian doctors produced under the rolling regimes, they work in the US. It's even actually now more than one third. So that I point out the contradictions. On Monday, they were accused Africa of um, underdeveloped education system, incapacity to train. On Tuesday, they will steal them. Uh, away from the very same people they've spent a lot of time abusing. Uh, the professor is an interdisciplinary scholar with a degree in psychology from Ghana, PhD in human development and social policy from Northwestern. I've been following her career for a long time and she's held visiting professorship at Boston Penn State University of Sussex, and she's one of um, uh, a scholar that the entire country should be proud of in terms of her contribution to policy engagement. She served as a consultant to many organizations, including the government of Ghana, and she has been commissioned on various projects by the British Council and some others 
and she's very prominent in Cordestria, where she serves on the executive committee uh, of that council. And she's been on the board, Mr. President, of the African Studies Association. And like um, Professor Usuansa, she's also served as a president of the Ghana Studies Association. At the moment, she's doing a lot of work with various journals, Your Excellency. She serves on the board of prominent journals, African Affairs, African Review of Economics and Finance and Policy Studies. And she went to school in part when you are president. So you can claim her as one of your experts. <laughs> 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 go, go and ask your question. Thank you, Professor and uh, good afternoon, Your Excellency. Good afternoon or good morning to you. We are in the same time zone because I'm in Accra. So. You are in Accra? Uh, oh, well, yes, yes. Good afternoon. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for actually anticipating my very first question because that was about the, how you reconciled a liberal democratic tradition and the idea of the private sector as an engine of growth with very important government funded government initiated programs like the national health insurance the school freedom program the capitation scheme and you've already said that you thought of yourself your administration as capitalist with a conscience and that is how <laughs> you could combine those two things so you've already answered my first question so i'll go on to my second <laughs> All right. Um, because I do work in social policy and because I'm very interested in women as a social group, um, I'm very interested in the behind the scenes of how you set up the Ministry of Women and Children's Affairs. Um, so how did you negotiate the resistance that comes with trying to institute gender equitable social policy? And I ask this question, not just for the history of it, but so that we can learn from that experience about how we can try to push through more inclusive and progressive policies that, that meets resistance from you know, wealthier people or from people in politics. So people in, in different, um, people in power who will have to give up some of that power for, for more vulnerable uh, social groups. Are you emphasizing on gender balance? I'm emphasizing yeah, on, 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 yes, gender equitable policies. So we know that setting up the Ministry of Women's and Children's Affairs met up with a lot of resistance within the cabinet, within parliament, even in the public. So how do you, did you manage to convince your administration and the society that this was important? So we can learn from that about how to push more gender equitable policies. I have always been, in a way, against tokenism. So when I decided to set up the, uh, that ministry of gender, I'm sure you remember the first minister I faced. Yes. Mrs. Asma, Gladys Asma, a very strong lady. Uh, when I say strong, in terms of intellect, uh, self confidence, she was an achiever in her own right and uh, highly respected uh, in the country, especially in the central and western region. She was the first minister for the, that. Even before we came to government, I believe she had been doing something like uh, uh, creating credit lines for market women all over the country. Even though it was a small scale, she was helping market women to access credit for their businesses, uh, to give them independence uh, from the traditional male-dominated system. And when she became the minister, I believe she laid the foundation so well, and that uh, the policy she ran, coupled with the uh, 
free compulsory universal basic education for all the children of Ghana, if you would remember, with emphasis on holding the girl child in school at the expense of the state till uh, about the age 14, age 15. So one, we avoided teenage pregnancies and also uh, equipped the girl child with the outlook uh, to uh, stand on her own feet, not rushing off to assist mother in uh, petty trading, leaving school uh, on the uh, uh, villages, carrying uh, firewood and foodstuffs uh, just to eke out uh, some living to support the family. All these things came together to give, lay the basis for the girl child wanting to move on to the senior high school because uh, as uh, the way of old said, educate the woman and you are in a way educating the nation. Uh, but the man tends to be very individual and individualistic and with a traditional background, such a man would become so domineering might not easily formulate the modern approach uh, when we talk of gender balance. So we, our approach was to use Mrs. Asma to set up the ministry and also to back her up with the free compulsory universal basic education, holding the girl child in schools, giving the free hot meal a day to all the children. And in places in Ghana, in the north, because of the free meal, even some poor parents were rushing in the afternoon to school so they could also get a bite. We went to any of our institutions in Ghana. Look at the professions. The girls are dominating in the professions like law, medicine, and look at you, psychology. And the happy and interesting thing is that they, they are also constrained in the abstruse sciences. If you like electrical engineering, when you go to Farm and Common University, I attended one of their uh, congregations, and I was so uh, delighted with girls taking first class in electrical engineering and all sorts of engineering things, mathematics. So I believe rapidly they are coming into uh, their own and take standing side by side. In my time, we appointed the first chief justice, lady chief justice, you would remember that. We also appointed, I believe, the first vice chancellor of Cape Coast, Madam Nana, who was the running mate to um, uh, <laughs> President Mahama in the last election. I, it was my time to give her the vice chancellorship of Cape Coast. So all these things were indicative of the, the, the outlook of the routine and also to inspire the young ladies that if they would apply their talents in the rapidly evolving society of Ghana, there's no way uh, any uh, force, traditional or male chauvinistic or whatever, that we hold them back. And it's happening. In my mini government, we had so many lady uh, ministers. And the one person, again, I should mention, Mrs. Tinrehesi, I'm sure you remember, she's now the chancellor of the University of Ghana. You remember that, Akira? And that lady was the first Ghanaian uh, lady principal secretary in the Ministry of Finance. She left the place to go to ILO to become number two. With the status like Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. When she retired from ILO in Switzerland and came back, I invited her. I said she should come and help us with government. She told me outrightly, no, she didn't like the title minister. So I said, forget about that title. Please come and be my chief advisor. Sitting in my cabinet, that's what she did. And when I talked of the uh, public sector reform, I put her in there to work, I think, with uh, Dr. Akosin Dunk. 
Sorry. To work with uh, Dr. Pacindo to open the psychology of the civil service to cooperating with the private sector so that together they would help to open up the society, the economy, and the nation for development. So this was how the approach was to look for the, the competent and spirited uh, female leaders. As I say, I, I, I don't like tokenism. I wanted the ladies to convinced that they, they have the competence. They've got it uh, to, to work on the... Anakwa, did you hear me? Yes, yes, I did, and thank you. Thank you so much. My final question is bringing us back to the present. So from your perspective as, you know, somebody who had to <laughs> make decisions during crisis times, and also as a former chair of ECOWAS, so having sort of a, a best eye view of what's Are happening. Are you sure it's there? Is listening? Oh, that's a good question. Sorry, he just rejoined. Okay. okay. He disappeared. You have to start all over. Thank you. I will when he gets back. Yes, I can hear you now. Do you hear my statement? Yes, we did. We did. We did before it went off. So thank you so much for that. May I ask you my final question? Yes. Okay, thank you. So this is bringing us back to the present. I wanted to ask you from your unique position um, as former president and also former chair of ECOWAS, how well do you think Ghana and the region has done in terms of our response to COVID? And especially looking at our unique situation where many of our people work in the informal sector and many are poor. How have we done in, in responding to this global pandemic? Unfortunately, uh, we've lost volume. I can't hear you too clearly. So if, if you would raise your voice a bit. All right. Come across. I wanted to find out how well you think we have done as um, a country and a region in dealing with the global pandemic, our response to COVID. How have we done? Could we have done better? I, I, I believe uh, the President Akufuado has shown great leadership since the onset. Um, from last year, I think about March or so, practically every week, He's come on the air to address the nation. Um, and he set up a very competent advisory group. Um, great doctors, social leaders, and all that, advising him. And uh, more or less charging the society to appreciate the menace. So we respect the protocols. Uh, like now, everywhere, People, you see people with uh, face masks, and then sanitization uh, of children in school, and social distancing. These have become like, if you like, culture with us. You know how very much we like shaking hands all over, especially at funerals. Now, we go to a funeral, the practice of social distancing, and everybody goes like, in the prayerful mood, we don't shake hands anymore. And it's all because of uh, the education, I would call it, and communication. Uh, the president and his uh, advisory team have given to the society across the board. And uh, just this week or so, uh, because of the, the spike of uh, the COVID-19, uh, president 
has come out also calling on the um, uh, the police and social services to ensure compliance everywhere in the marketplaces, in the law stations, through the local government uh, institutions, uh, that people appreciated the necessity to observe the protocol. Uh, because uh, all of a sudden, so just about a month ago, we thought we were almost getting out of the of the yeah. pandemic. But then all of a sudden, the numbers shot up. And uh, you see the government everywhere uh, now. So I believe the government has done quite well. And the national was assessed, was even rated as one of the best right. uh, nations in the fight against uh, the pandemic. Thank this you. is great. Thank you. I, I wanted to just ask a quick follow-up, if I may. And let's Please finish. go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Professor. So beyond Ghana, I wanted to find out as a continent, right, there has been some suggestion that we should not follow some of the same uh, stringent lockdowns and, and, and um, economic restrictions and social restrictions as in other countries because we don't have the same kinds of social protections because a lot of people you know work in the informal sector they don't they they live from hand to mouth is there anything that you think on the continent makes us unique so that we should take a different approach from what is being done elsewhere in the world any thoughts on that You couldn't hear you. Okay. Well, he did answer my main question, so I think I'll, I'll end here. Thank you, Professor. Well, let's try. <laughs> yes. he um, he's reconnecting. He's okay. reconnecting. Let's try. We, we have to keep apologizing to the audience for this um, internet disruption. Oh, um, sorry, he's he's reconnecting again. He he connected briefly and is joining back on. Hello, it seems you are back with us again, except that your mic is muted. You hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Traveling from Djibouti in the east of the continent, across the continent to Dakar in the west, by some of the fastest jets you can get, takes as long as nine hours. And from Cairo in the north to Cape Town in the south, it takes you again about nine hours. It's a very big continent full of nations. And yes. uh, to talk of Africa like just a spot of a country, I don't think it's something to indulge in. It's a continent, it's really a huge continent of many countries of different levels of development and all that. And so I would urge that uh, the African Union should use some of the best scientific advice we can master to guide us in the various uh, uh, situations as nations on the continent. So any talk of uh, not doing what is being done, say, in Europe or in America, we have to be careful about that. We should be guided by science. That's my attitude. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Falula, for the opportunity. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, the difficult questions are ready. And they are coming from the younger generation. People like the students in your foundation 
students in college, we always give them an opportunity. This is a new generation. And we've, they've, they, we've drawn them from various places, including universities in Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda. They met and they selected two of them to represent them, Obina Akara and Papa Nkrumah Apabio. They all met and they'll be posing the questions, not all the questions, just the ones they selected uh, to represent their generation. Welcome, the new generation. Thank you, Professor Fazi. And I hope uh, you use me as grandfather to give you grandfatherly opinions. <laughs> you consider relevant to your situations. <laughs> we will be sure to do that. Your Excellency Akwaba, um, it's an honor to have you here with us today. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, welcome and for joining us today. As arguably one of the most influential political figures in Ghana and Africa, we're glad to have the opportunity to glean some wisdom from your legacy as a public servant. And we hope that our conversation, and we hope that conversation with you can be illuminating to our present in light of the storied history. So without further ado, let's begin our conversation. I'll hand it over to Obena, who has the first question for you. Yes, um, Your Excellency, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, Your Excellency, we would be grateful if you would take the time to reflect with us on your career, your experiences, and your actions. Specifically, um, please, what moments in your career have brought you great pride? And also conversely, what, which ones would you consider to be your greatest pitfalls? I started my political career. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Am sir. I coming yes, across? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, I started, I don't know how old you are now, but in my 20s, I was 27 years old. When I, and of course, a young lawyer, when I launched myself into the uh, management of the Secretary of Commerce, in fact, I became the equivalent of, uh, if you like, mayor or city manager at that age. And I held that office for three years, uh, managing a staff of about 4,000, looking after the second city of Ghana. The population then must have been about, about 2 million or so. And uh, when I was assessed as a good manager by the people, and this was 67. 1967. By 1969, uh, when Ghana was being returned from the military rule that took over after Nkrumah, I was elected to parliament at the age of 30, member of parliament of Ghana at the age of 30, and the then government made me the deputy foreign minister of Ghana at the age of 30. That exposed me internationally. Uh, to the United Nations, to the Organization of African Unity, uh, non-aligned movement, and that sort of thing. And so internationally, quickly. And you can imagine, at that age, being given such an exposure and interacting with the political leaders and giants of the time. Uh, that really registered deeply with me. Uh, but then, soon after 72 uh, January, the government in which I served was overthrown by the soldiers, and the soldiers picked any member of government they could get. 
uh, and then threw them into political detention. So oh, sorry, once again, everyone, I apologize. It seems like for one year, three months, in uh, when you know a crowd. You Once again, everyone, I apologize. It seems the present is um, having some connection issues. Um, sorry, Your Excellency, please. Can you hear us? Sir, I'm sorry, uh, please can you hear us? We asked you on mute. Oh. That was another look. But then I had my choice. And then said, okay. Uh, oh, um, when I was Your free, Excellency. When I was free, uh, after a short stay, I was released from prison. Then, then cool, led by the late president, Rawlings. The very next day I was after my release, the cool makers invited me and said they wanted me to serve as the, the local government sector, the equivalent of local government minister. Because I managed to take a picture of uh, Ghana Kumasi, successful for two years. I, uh, it was something I could take in my, in my stride. I did. I left. I stayed there with them for only six months because I couldn't understand what the, 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 that regime was about. Even though it proved to be a very long lasting one. As you know, President Rawlings, or that time, Chairman Rawlings, stayed in power for the next, is it 19 years? The longest serving head of state of Ghana. Uh, so th that was at the beginning. So I did only six months with them. But then that regime had put the country under curfew. That lasted three long years, during which the economy really was broken. And uh, the regime styling itself as left of center wouldn't cooperate with the multilaterals or donor community or anybody. And locally, too, it talked about uh, more or less dismantling the private sector. I couldn't be part of that regime. And six months, I seized an occasion during which, during the curfew, three judges, including a lady judge and a military officer, were abducted and they were slot, slotted, shot, and burnt. But for the fact that it rained that night, perhaps there wouldn't have been any trace at all of this. So I seized on that, thanked the regime, and said I couldn't continue in service with them. But even before that thing happened and I left, I had left um, a policy blueprint of decentralization. Because the revolutionaries wanted to say they wanted to give participatory government, they wanted everybody uh, from grassroots up to be part of government. So I said, if that's what you wanted, then from 
my humble background in local government, the approach would be decentralization, devolve power from the center to the local uh, uh, grounds, which thankfully the regime accepted, and I left them and went back into business. So from 83 through to 92, when the regime uh, decided to return the country to civil rule and did a new constitution, that to me proved to be quite democratic. I went to politics, my, my party tradition regrouped and we formed uh, the new patriotic party. 92, when the ban on party politics was lifted, I tried to be my party's candidate to challenge President Rawlings, who had also converted from military dictatorship to a uh, civilian party leader, the, the, the National Democratic Congress. Eh? I, my party was New Patriotic Party. I wanted to get the leadership to contest it, but my party swept me and gave it to Professor, late Professor D. Wine, a historian like uh, a colleague, I presume, of Professor Falola, uh, because I do had given an academic uh, speech, I think in 1988, which had impressed the country so much, and I do was the, can the candidate. But by 96, during my party's conference, I, the leadership was given me uh, it, against Adu, and I became the challenger for uh, Rawlings in 96. Rawlings, of course, was the incumbent president, and uh, <laughs> you know politics on our continent. For an opposition uh, struggling candidate to make a dent on a very tough, uh, strong, um, charismatic, youngish president uh, with all the incumbency advantages. It wasn't a small thing. But in the election, um, the election commissioner or commission declared him the winner. But at least they graciously said I had garnered 39 point something percent, which was quite remarkable. Uh, my party favored me 98 for the election of 2000. And it was in that election that I won, uh, beating uh, late uh, Vice President uh, Mills, uh, who had the backing of President Rawlings. Um, they were incumbents but the country swung to my side and voted for me. And that, as I said earlier, was the first time my party had had a chance to come into power, which we managed and held for two consecutive terms as the Constitution of Ghana, uh, at least uh, in the Third Republic, or Fourth Republic allowed. And in, it was in that time that uh, I, uh, because I had win, been winged politically from uh, on the Buzia, liberal democracy, uh, capitalistic, uh, but truly democratic and con respect for constitutions and human rights and democracy. Because of that, I came in with that manifesto of ushering in the golden age of business to create the wealth and to also do the social interventions, which the Ghanaians came to like. So throughout the eight years, I tell you, it became the high point of development in the country. So this yes, uh, this uh, became the high point. Me becoming president after a sojourn in the wilderness of over 30 years, being given the chance by the nation to become president. Uh, you can imagine, it was virtually like uh, re venturing into a dreamland. I'm very happy that in my chosen field I had made it. But then immediately I saw that uh, the economy, as I said earlier, was broken, and how to do it. We had to adopt the highly indebted poor country initiative, which wasn't popular. My, even my own cabinet thought going that way would be demeaning. 
because people thought it would be declaring yourself or the government or the nation as insolvent, then they couldn't take it. But I also thought if we really wanted to make an impact within the four year tenure, that was the way to go. So I think uh, with sound management of the macroeconomy and all, our creditors will be formed by the terms of the, uh, that project uh, the, that IMF had passed to get the debt cancellation. And with the success of it, because we attained that in record time, we got to the completion point in record time. Ghana came to be forgiven initially over four billion dollars of debt that we couldn't service. First year alone, we needed about a quarter of a billion dollars, which we didn't have, just to service the debt we owed. And so I said, let's go that way. So we will write off all these things that would deprive us of the chance to govern. With that policy, I would credit with the highest point of achievement. I like it. And it worked because we followed it up with sound management of the economy, coupling that with uh, good democratic practices, upholding the constitution. Uh, the, the first law we repealed was the criminal libel law that earlier governments from colonial times had used to muzzle the media. And without media, there wasn't any criticism. But we needed criticism to practice good governance. So what we, that too was done. We made the farmers happy. And in consequence, even later after my retirement, I and the president of Brazil, Lula, the two of us, 2011, were given the World Food Prize. So that, this policy is the high point. I would credit that way. But into my second term, second year, I mean, not second term, second year as president, a very, very, very sad uh, disaster occurred in Ghana. A, a, one of the northern kings, North Dagomba, Yana of the, the Dagomba traditional area, got assassinated there. And it looked like a failure of my government uh, to uh, not providing the necessary security for that king. So you could imagine a, a young government tottering just two years into government, not even two full years, but one and a half years, uh, finding itself confronted with uh, this regicide. And the Gomba is the, uh, I think, in the northern part of Ghana, the most populous tradition or tribe. And I was at my wit's end on how to tackle the challenge. Uh, thankfully, we tried initially using the legal system. It went some way, commissions of inquiry and order. But then the, the, the people there didn't accept this uh, solution too readily. Then it occurred to me to use traditional arena. So I appealed to three powerful traditional monarchs in Ghana, the Asantehne, that's the, uh, the middle belt of Ghana, who's popular, right? Uh, with very ancient relations to uh, the Dagombas, whose uh, king had been killed. And then two northern chiefs, uh, the Nairi, uh, uh, an old monarchy straddling Ghana and Burkina Faso, and who, by tradition, was related to the, the king that had been killed, and also the Yabura of uh, the, the biggest landlord of the north, also traditional. I begged these chiefs to come together to appeal to uh, the tribe whose king had been killed. They worked at it in my time. We succeeded in providing a road to tackle the problem. It seemed to work, but somehow, uh, the politics of the situation, the whole problem got so politicized nationally. We didn't get the solutions through my two terms until just two years ago. These traditional leaders, the kings of Asante, uh, uh, Mamprosi, and Gonja, they struggled and toiled and uh, toiled, and it took them 17 years to get a solution. Thankfully, now uh, there has been reconciliation, and a new king has been installed there. And to succeed. But so these were, my toughest thing was the regicide. But 
my pleasure. Then in that I want to claim as credit is succeeding and taking Ghana out of the huge indebtedness that altogether ended up with about eight billion United United States dollars of debt being written off for us to free the economy to manage for Ghana to become middle income. I would give my highest point to that policy we took in the first year of government and then in the second the worst time for the feeling of that that thing. So uh, this is how I've done so much. Yes. Your Excellency, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, in, in general, what I actually get from this is that um, the, the, the job of the president is a very, very hard job where you have, to, I'm, I'm guessing you have to balance some popular decisions with, um, with the end goal that you are trying to achieve um, and also um, just management. Um, I would love to ask some more follow-up questions, but unfortunately, I think I might need to move on to the next one because of time. Oh, sorry, sir. Um, oh, sorry, sir. Can you hear me now? No, but now you are coming. Do you repeat the question for me, please? Oh, yes, yes. So um, I said thank you very much. Um, a, for the main thing I get from from your your stories have is that first of all, you have a very very long a very, very uh, interesting career. But also the job of the president is, is, a, is a tough one in which you have to balance making sometimes unpopular decisions with the end goals that you want, that you believe are better for your country, right? And like essentially what you said with Hippie. Yeah, right. Yeah. But then, yes. The other side is the management of people, right? Um, a lot of the time, I feel like it's very, uh, it's mis there's a lot of mystification that goes with the role of the presidency in which you don't know, you don't really know what the president does. Um, there's a lot of politics involved, but a lot of management and a lot of planning. So um, thank you. That was very, very, very insightful. I would love to ask some more follow-up questions, but because of time, I need to move on to the next one, I believe. Yes. Should I so, you? oh, oh, yes, please, if you, if you. You are very right in assessing presidency. Look, uh, for fun, uh, people mock presidents because just after a year or two in office, you see all your hair going gray. I see your hair is very dark. Suppose you are thrown into presidency now. I tell you, within two years, you see streaks of grace all over. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind, but I would suggest you look at President Obama of America. <laughs> He's still a young man in his 50s. But look at him now, after his stint in presidency. You might think he's already 60, 70. That's the, 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 the lot of a president, if you really uh, put your shoulders to the wheel to work as a good president. It's a balancing thing, uh, but the whole idea should, I think, should be uh, captured in, a, if you like, description of servant leadership. Servant of whom? Servant of the people. The real sovereign authority is the people. Is their power, and if you are democratic, that's what I'm talking about. Is their power they assign to you, to you to lead them to try to better their lot across the board, inclusively. A party may throw you into office. But once you get there, you belong to the entire public of the nation. And thinking, uh, making policies and implementing policies for the generality of the people, I tell you, is no joke at all. Uh, they, I think some ancient wise man is credited with having said uh, what uh, the, 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 the wearer of the crown that time to have sleepless nights. The uneasy lies there. The crown head. The uneasy, uneasy lies ahead that wears the crown. The leader should have vision, should have aspirations for the nation. And along the way, when you are so driven or motivated, you tend to think medium to long term for the great things, transforming the nation. But I tell you, the generality of people are grassroots. They, they work by the day. If you come to Ghana, you go to the market, 
see it. It's very populous. In fact, the informal sector, as you tend to describe them, uh, is much bigger than the formal sector, which is the government and corporate entities. So it's easier to manage the formal sector. But the informal sector, uh, where most of the votes are, the votes they cast to make you president, they work by the day. They go to market, market women, uh, uh, truck pushers, uh, lorry drivers, taxi drivers, the, the unemployed youth. They want their daily bread. So if the economy is not working today, if the market woman goes to the market and she's not able to sell for a day or two or three, all the blame will be put on the government. You are not a, a receptive, uh, sensitive um, government. They will blame you. And you can be sure you do not do something quickly about that. Next round of elections, it's only four years there. They are all going to vote against you. Yes. So a so, government must try to find solutions to satisfy the most of the people in the grassroots. Even as, at the same time, he thinks of medium to long term, term things, building uh, infrastructure, big roads, uh, uh, telecommunications, electricity, so forth and so on. Attracting yes. the credit lines, that would not break the economy and that must be managed well. So it's not an easy job at all. So yes, yes. we must try to balance between the popular things as well as the hard things that must be tackled so that when they all come together, you see a successful governance for the people. Wow, thank you, Your Excellency. So, so like, um, over to you. so in some ways to use an analogy, it's like you have it's like you go on a journey and you have a view of where you want to go to, but you have to remember that you, you have to walk there. So you have to take short steps. Um, very much. Yeah. So your excellency, and it's, it's, I'm very happy that you brought up, um, there's a statement that you made that in, in a democ democratic institution. And I want to ask you a question on democracy and also follow up on something that you uh, talked about earlier on, especially with regards to like the five term uh, five-year terms five so yeah. yes your excellency ghana is often hailed as a beacon of democracy in africa um kabi namin kebi if i'm right um you say your own and then i will say my own um so however some have argued that there are downsides with that come with the wholesale adoption of a western style of democracy in developing countries so with this context, my first question, please, what are your thoughts on democracy and its effectiveness as a preferred form of governance for developing African countries, especially considering long-term socioeconomic development and the continuity between consecutive governments? Yes. Yeah, this is an academic question you are putting to me. But I'll tell you, I'll challenge you to find the regimes that have not used democracy to govern, that have succeeded in providing the long-term uh, successful economic and social development you quote, I do not see much or any on our continent yet. But me, I don't want to be sort of um, tied to uh, democracy as exclusively Western. Uh, if you are going back in history, I believe the whole idea is credited to the, the Grecian ancient Greece. But they practice their democracy in a very small population, uh, city states, uh, where everybody could go to the marketplace. But the whole idea was to avoid dictatorship. The whole idea was to recognize citizenry as the, the home of sovereignty, according individual being the right to participate in how he or she is governed. That to me, that's the basic uh, the definition of democracy. When you transpose it from ancient times to now, we are very populous now, but you look at the history of Africa, and let me again zoom in on Ghana. From slave trade, around the 15th, 
century, 16th century, till the 18th century, when even after the abolition of the trade was said to be done, uh, we got reduced to colo colonization. We became like the property, the assets of Britain. We didn't have the say in how we were governed. We were subjects. And that continued till 1957, when I was already, I think, about uh, is it 15, 16 years old. We, nobody in our country really had a real say in how the nation was managed and the fortunes of the nation, how they were allocated to benefit the grassroots. All our raw materials, like gold, like coal, like timber, they were all exported to Britain. Those contributed to develop modern Britain and through their war efforts in the Second World War and all. How much of it came back to our people? So at point of independence, the psychology, we've been more or less so brainwashed. We, our self-confidence had been so sapped as people, as individuals. We came into independence. The Constitution at independence looked like fashioned on the, if you like, in inverted commas, Western type of democracy. Well, the first republic, but it wasn't a republic because we went republic till 1960. After independence, we still remained under the British monarchy. Uh, mm -hmm. Tried, but really didn't work the democratic governance the way it was done in Britain. Uh, but by 1960, uh, we became a republic. So we had our first president, Nkrumah. By which time, within this short space of three years, from 57 to 60, the Preventive Detention Act had been passed. And what was it? It was a law that empowered the government of the day to arrest opponents or dissenting voices and throw them into prison camps without trial, to be held for five years continuous without trial, at the end of which the government still had power, and if you like, to renew the detention. Along the way, within that short space of time, uh, the economy, the population was only 6 million, about 57. By even 1970, uh, when I had matured to become member of parliament, population was not bigger than 10 million. But at independence with population of just 6 million, we had reserves, the central bank, of the equivalent of about 400 million United States dollars. By 1962, just four or five years, all the reserves had gone. Yes, the first government, in a way, tried to uh, uh, launch itself into an industrialization process. To industrialize without trained managers, without study of markets, uh, without the technology, uh, it was perhaps too idealistic. Then instead of approaching things step by step, we didn't do it that way. So the country got dotted with so all sorts of, uh, if you like, industries, but not too well studied industries. We didn't study the markets where the products would be taken to. Uh, the infrastructure. Well, we did uh, the Akusumbo Dam, not by 1962. Akusumbo wasn't done, finished till about 65. But at least uh, some investment was made in that direction. But then, because uh, we, we found ourselves at work initially with dollars, and because we were so zealous about freeing the entire continent of Africa, our government started dashing out $10 million to Cuba. Cash flows. But we didn't fight the American. Tell me, was it a loan or a gift from Little Guinea? Ten million somewhere in East Africa, ten million Guinea. So before we knew by nineteen sixty two, all the reserves had come. And then out of desperation, a government 
because they start, had started rationing around picking loans. But because government had also, again, uh, fallen into, uh, if you like, the huge bipolar uh, discourse, you know, taking left of center, immediately we think that the Cold War would grab you. And in those times, Soviet Union, China, communist China didn't have the resources to give credit. Those with the credit had uh, marched us out as uh, people they couldn't work with. And so the expression set in in Ghana by uh, 63, uh, heavyweight, one of the big six, uh, Obechevi Obe Lamte, for instance, had died in detention under very questionable circumstances without trial. By 1965, the dwelling of Ghana politics, J.B. Dankwa, also died in prison without trial, detention. And all these things came together. So by 65, basic things like washing soap, uh, toilet paper, people had to queue to get them. Ghana had started seeing near poverty. That was what led to the overthrow of the first regime, a uh, Republican regime, I think. And so people said, was it democracy, uh, the first regime practice, or was it strong manship with perhaps an exclusive vision of how Africa, Ghana should go? So, so, so let's go back to the constitution that gave, empowered the individual with the vote to decide who should govern and on their term. Because by 65, our president had been, become president for life. By 64, and about, it, we had become one party state. So the people that didn't see the virtues of this society decided, let's go back and let's acknowledge the individual citizen as the repository of power, which to me is democracy. It's not like English or American or whatever. It's the individual. We, we have lost our self-respect through slave trade, through colonialism. And when we were said to be independent along that, we weren't given that self-respect and acknowledgement. We had come to own it. It's ours. There's no state without the individual. So uh, when we talk democracy, we are not copying uh, blindly, say, British or French or no, no, no. With us, I'm acknowledging you as a, a human individual, a universal man entitled to be acknowledged as such and to let you know that you, you have your talent, you, you, you think, you must be allowed right of expression. In fact, it's yours. Nobody should take it from you. And the right of choice, who should be your leader? Otherwise, then we are back in colonization or under strong men, most of whom so far haven't proved that they were uh, like a Greek philosopher kings or anything like that. The yes, yes. Allow the individual to exercise the right of vote and let the so, decision that we want to lead prove that he will genuinely be a servant leader coming in with manifestos to show how to govern the uh, economy to make it productive. So that with the dividends, we will then provide education, uh, health care, infrastructure, and those with the ability to create, let them, but ensure that there's a regulatory mechanism that they contribute what they must contribute to the national coffers, with which the government then will do the work for the people inclusively. That's what my government tried to do. We were not copying yeah. this or so anything like that. Yes, Your Excellency, this, this has been very insightful because um, in, in summary, I feel like what you're saying is that um, despite the difficulties that democratic institutions empower the people and help hold the public servants accountable. Um, I, I didn't get the question because now they put the oh, um, me, so you can see the question for me. Yes, sorry. Um, so in summary, it feels like what you're saying is that democratic institutions, even in African 
especially in African countries, empower the people and help hold public servants accountable. You are talking yes. about accountability. Uh, it's a constitutional, institutional arrangement. Uh, the idea of the constitution uh, being owned by the people who promulgate it is really to indicate that the people are responsible, they know what they want, and they know how they want to be governed, responsible citizenship. But then it's through this responsibility too that they are able to exact accountability from the governors, the people they themselves make governors. Governors must be accountable to the governors who are the true uh, sovereign authority. And uh, with the help of institutions like the media and then multi-party practice, the, those who for the time being have been elected as governors, they're watched. The, 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 the accountability is exacted from them through the media, through the opposition party, and through these institutions. And all these uh, checks and balances put redound to the benefit of the citizenry, the individual. This is, to me, the essence of democratic government. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We're going to shift a bit to uh, what might be our last question. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you know there's there's a lot of young Ghanaian people leaving Ghana to go abroad, or people who when they went, or people who when they went into the um, the villages couldn't stay there and left. There's also some apathy amongst, you know, Ghanaian youth and African youth because of corruption. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Now, since you are coming across. Okay. So I was asking about, you know. Please, your question. Yes, thank you. So the question I'm asking is, regarding apathy amongst the amongst Ghanaian and African youth because of corruption in government um, and just um, not seeing the change they want to see what why should why should the African youth be interested in public service and politics and why should they sacrifice you know leaving the country to maybe go and to enjoy safety somewhere else or benefit somewhere else in order to make Ghana a better place, or Africa a better place. Have you finished your question? Yes, that's my question. How can you hope to develop Africa from some other place than Africa? If you think there's so much corruption in Africa, and you want to fight it, and I like the way you generalize the youth, then I tell you the place to fight corruption is in Africa. You come here, and this is why, again, I subscribe to democratic governance. Look, Ghana went to polls in December. The incumbent government at the polls had the majority in parliament of uh, is it about 169. It's a house of 275. And till the election, just December, the incumbent government had majority in uh, parliament of 169 seats. By December 9th, when the results were counted, the people of Ghana had voted so massively to reduce that majority to 137 votes. So the opposition that used to be like 105 or so jumped from 105 to 137, so it's a split out, equal, equally balanced. This is how to put the government on its toes. This is how to ensure if there's corruption, the, dictator, uh, the, the, the governing party or the, the executive, it can no longer do it because by the constitution, the executive would not get its budget approved except by this parliament that is now split. 
So the president must be really on top of the game to convince such a balance house to support it, to get a budget to rule, to govern. I believe they are doing it the right way. And so if the youth of Africa isn't so disgruntled and dis dis disillusioned to want to leave Africa to go to Europe and the United States and China to live in the comforts there and then uh, look down their noses on the continent of their birth. And I tell you, if you really are an African and you mean to change Africa, the place for you to be is to come here. Uh, like under the constitution of Ghana now, there are so many young people. I believe the average age of parliament now will not be higher than about 40. They are youth. And they are doing something to try to correct whatever perceptions they have that are wrong. Here in Ghana, they are not doing it from the United States or Britain or France or whatever. So please, uh, we, we are still a young country. And when I say Ghana is young, it means most of Africa, Sub-Sahara, are even younger because Ghana was the first to have gained independence in 1967. Most of the rest got independence in 1950. So come back and join the fight against corruption and all the misgovernance here. Rather than sit out there and say you rather uh, uh, relish the comforts of, say, Texas or wherever, and then try to preach to us on the continent. But that's not acceptable. So come and bring your knowledge, your thoughts, and all. You've acquired great knowledge. You've seen experiences uh, like in the developed world. We want all those things here. I was talking of negotiating skills. It's people like you with your acquired insights over there that will help uh, enrich government and empower it to learn and negotiate well. We cannot just in partnerships. The African Union is now talking of new partnership for the development of Africa, NEPA. Because we realize that technologically, uh, it will take quite some doing for us to come address the developed world. We need the capital. We have natural resources, but it's not that too. Capital, we need the investments. Uh, we don't have the investments right here. We may need partners. They would need something from us, and we need something from them. That's the process of globalization. We must learn to negotiate on the, on the level. So it would be win win for all of us. And those of you who are so exposed, you understand that. I tell you, knowing politics is crucial. You must come and then help with the governance here. Yeah? So then uh, we can take it to the rest of the world. The, the answer is not for us to leave Africa, then talk of outside Africa on how to make Africa better. Thank you. Sir, uh, we, we, we received, sir, Your Excellency, so many questions from members of the audience. There's so many. Uh, I will send them to your staff, but I, I to respect, uh, let me start all over, sir. We received many questions from the audience. And even before the interview, many days ago, we've been receiving so many questions. Unfortunately, we cannot, um, We, re we receive so many questions. I hear you. We receive so many questions but we will not be able to post them. There's so many. Well, the problems are many. <laughs> so, uh, actually, we need much more time. Yeah. So not to disrespect uh, members of the audience, we'll just take one or two. 
They sent us so many questions, but there's no time. But we'll respect them. Yeah. And just, and I've chosen Indidi Akara just to select randomly two questions from the hundreds we've received. Please go ahead. Hello everyone, and thank you, Your Excellency, for talking with us for so long. Um, so one of the questions was, um, what is your opinion on the legacy of service our generation of, your generation of leaders um, have left for the succeeding ones? And what does that mean for the future of governance in Africa? Unfortunately, you are not audible enough, but I okay. heard you talk of generation. Yes. Okay, I'll ask it again. So what is your opinion of the legacy of service your generation of leaders have left for the succeeding ones? Um, and what does that mean for the future of governance in Africa? Um, my generation of leaders, I hope we, we are uh, uniform in uh, sharing in value systems and all and even the practice of governance. I can't say we are, but what I've seen across our continent is the spread of education. I believe education truly is the key uh, by which uh, we restore the self-confidence and the insight in our people, wherever it is, uh, whether East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, the North Africa, it's education, and I see the spread of education uh, among our youth. And also, I also sense the, 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 the acquisition of, uh, and mastery of the new technologies like IT. Uh, our youth, you are excelling. Let me, I, I still don't see myself as even literate in the new technologies, but you are. And uh, you are open to the world. So uh, wherever you are, whether in America, you are beginning to shine and standing on your own, uh, shoulder to shoulder and eyeball to eyeball, as they say. So uh, but we came by this and away from the generation. Uh, I'm a generation or two ahead of you. But if, say, with all our faults and defects as early governors, we hadn't at least our nations and communities on the trajectory uh, where you now find yourself. I don't think you would have gotten there. So at least uh, uh, you should give us some of the credit of what you are, uh, where you've gained insight, and also you are going in the self-confidence to hold your own against all other comers. Uh, so in due course, I see that we are in a phase, a transitional phase on the continent. And my prayer is that sooner than later, I will truly be part of the globalization process. And Africa will come to have leaders that will stand uh, uh, equal with all the other parts of, uh, of the globe, of the planet. So uh, Africa will not for granted as it has tended to be taken so far down the centuries. Uh, so this is the main thing is for the youth to be given more and more education and also for the, uh, the visitors to be open so they know that we are not an island. We are part of the planet, part of the globe. Look at the pandemics hit hitting us. Look at the current one, COVID-19. Look at the climate change. Who can escape it? Neither the, the West or the East. We are all in the same boat. So the thing to do is how for Africa to uh, equip itself quickly with the humanity that would go into the mainstream of the global efforts to find solutions to free us from all these uh, menaces so that. Uh, the world becomes a, a better place for humanity to live. So this is uh, how I would answer you. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, and so, oh, sorry. 
I'm not coming out loudly enough. Oh, sorry. I was saying thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, and it, yes, it was very helpful to hear from you. So the final question from the audience is concerning Africa's relations with China. Um, some would argue that African countries are eager to associate themselves with China, um, and they wanted to know Hello. your thoughts. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you repeat the question again, please? Yes. So the second question from the audience is concerning Africa's relation with China. Um, some would argue that Africa is very eager to associate, um, well, African countries are eager to associate themselves with China. Um, and they wanted to know your thoughts um, on, I guess, Chinese financing of um, infrastructure and things like that. Is it dangerous? Is this a good um, sort of right, alliance? Right, Oh, sorry. The, 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 the line broke several times. So oh, it's breaking. Yes, of course. So I was saying the final question from the audience is concerning Africa's relationship with China. Um, some would argue that Africa is very eager to associate with China, um, consider, considering the fact that China is financing infrastructure projects um, across the continent. So what are your thoughts um, on this relationship, this alliance? Um, and also, would you have any advice concerning um, these relationships, but also just in general, um, as we close out the interview? Um, I, I said earlier, Hello? No, no, it was broken. But I, I heard China okay. and Africa's relations, and some are, people are criticizing that uh, we shouldn't lock ourselves in, uh, like exclusively in China. Yes. Um, well, I, I said earlier that what Africa needed, above all, was. Um, that negotiating skill or skills against all comers. They could be Chinese, they could be Americans, they could be Russians, or from wherever. If we have leaders that would appreciate that these people are not coming with pistols in their hands against our heads, like the colonial times or uh, slave trade times, these days they will come and then try to induce us or entice us into some very questionable agreements. Virtue is not locked in any one corner. It, virtue is not exclusive to our erstwhile colonial masters or, say, America supposedly the citadel of uh, the West, or China, which is really galloping along to become uh, the biggest economy in the world. They all come for what they can gain. Why our leaders know this and would appreciate that they come not to the lab of us, but for what they can get from us, from our continent. And our leaders would use the best and know how and practices. So we negotiate early. It's a competing world and it gets more and more competitive. So we get our fair share. And they get also a fair share of what they came for. Once we do that, I tell you, uh, we, we shouldn't be afraid of whoever comes. The reality, though, is that the West, generally, like our former colonial, uh, they, they encouraged this too much, and then the time we got to be defenders, some virtually retreated, but abandoned us. Instead of uh, coming to build some of the industrial base with us, so they would do employment, and also we hold the treaty with them. They didn't do it. And uh, in time, when uh, Africa is now 
uh, ambitious also to do its own industrialization and open up the continent, build uh, continental railroads and uh, telecommunications. We, we want credit, we can't get credit from, say, Europe. It's China that will come and offer the business. And of course, as we've seen, the reps of choice, uh, even China, in many times, takes on due uh, advantage of us. So it should be our leaders um, coming to terms of the situation as it is now, and then uh, strengthening themselves and us be able to say no when we see the deal is not good. And when it is right or good, whether it's coming from east or west, once we satisfy ourselves that this is the good of Africa for our people, then we sign it and go ahead. I'm not uh, uh, listening to people who want to lump us on the old basis of east, west, that sort of thing. No. Because it's opening up. Uh, whether we like it or it's getting more and more competitive, but moving on, as I said, science and technology, we must equip ourselves with that. Leadership must decide or make policies on sound advice, east west, so that uh, sound advice by of science and technology, so that whether they are coming from east or west, we can equip, negotiate, fair always seeking what is good for us and certain terms. And of course, they come what they think and get, so they must also get something. So it will be win-win. I believe the African Union has shown awareness of this. This is why African Union partner, the new partnership for Africa because, because they say so specifically that this would be the way for Africa to leapfrog into the mainstream the globalization process. Uh, the African Union has said it over 10 years ago. So uh, it should be for the leaders really to live uh, to this uh, injunction. Uh, uh, just who wouldn't do this and uh, would go cup in hand and that sort of thing. And we'll be saving the, the people of Africa. Thank you. I would now like to invite Professor Bafu Agiaman, who is the Executive Director of the please, Kufu please Foundation. I would like to invite Professor Bafu Agiaman, the Executive Director of the Kufu Foundation, to spend five minutes to talk about the foundation. Oh, you want to invite Bafu? Yes, he will talk about yes, the foundation. Please. Uh, he's the CEO of my foundation. Yes. And uh, together with me, we are trying to uh, mature the foundation to mentor the youth, like the students we are interacting with now, to uh, become the sort of leaders of Africa we are talking about in the near future. Okay, sir. Professor Agerman. Yeah. Yeah. We... Okay. You hear me now? Yes. It's my delight to add a few words to what His Excellency has said. And I think well, in I his remark in his remarks, I think he has covered exactly what the foundation stands for. Basically it comes from the president's own vision of getting the kind of right leadership for Africa's development. That is why the focus has been on preparing young people for leadership. We are targeting students in our tertiary institutions, currently only Ghana, but we have long-term plans of including students from other African countries. And they will provide them mentorship and coaching. 
and expose them to a variety of activities that are designed to give them character, character of integrity and non-toxic nationalism. This is what basically we do. Only because, as the president will tell you and he keeps telling us, in all his years in public service, and you were told that he started this when he was only 27 years, in all his years of public service, what he has come to see as the weakest link in Africa's development is leadership. And he has explained it at length. So my good friend, Tony, what we are trying to do here is to provide the knowledge and the skills and the commitment that young people need today in order to become effective leaders for the development of our continent. That has been the focus. And this comes directly from the president's own vision of how Africa's development to proceed. That's all I can add to what he said. Thank you very much. As the conversation was ongoing, I was receiving messages on chat on my telephone that we should bring back the president. Some said because of the technical difficulties, some said because they need to hear more. We'll be arranging that uh, in future. Uh, and sometimes if some people insist on the questions, I will send the questions to him and they can give a written answer, which we can now circulate globally. Are you hearing me, sir? Your Excellency, can you hear me, sir? Yes, he cannot hear me. I hear you, and I'm taking notes I can share with him. But we want to thank him. He has to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Bina, can you do something? He has Hello? to hear them. Yes? Uh, OK. Please tell him the wish of the people that he should come back. Okay. Before I close, I want to announce our future programs. In two days time on Sunday, we'll be interviewing His Excellency, President Ulusha Gwabasanjo, the former president of Nigeria, which will be on Sunday. We, uh, we invite you, all of you to join. It will be 5 p.m. Nigerian time and 10 a.m. Austin time. Do please join us. Uh, we've also had commitments from other African presidents. And we'll be inviting the Awolo family, the prominent um, Nigerian nationalist of Afem Awolo, will be coming after Basanjo. And we also invite scholars. We invite them um, intellectuals, we bring them um, younger people, we bring activists and please be on our mailing list so that um, you can also always participate. What do we do next? Two things with this interview. I do three reflections of various newspapers and the internet. We break down the interview into three podcasts. This is going to be a little bit of a challenge because of the various um, breakdown, but we'll see. And what the podcast does is to release this to the entire world and people have been using it. Mr. President, I know you can't hear me and um, Professor Bafour Agemandua will communicate our respect to you. We are full of gratitude. We know time is very difficult. You're actually trending on social media as we speak, mm -hmm. on WhatsApp. I think you are trending a lot uh, because of the attendance at the Rollins funeral. 
and people took your photographer side of it and it's all over the world on WhatsApp now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thank um, uh, my senior colleague, Professor David Uswansa, my junior colleague, Professor Nana Aindo, all the members of our team, they've done a lot of work, many practices. I thank the staff of the president, Mr. Edu and others. We've held two practices with them, setting up this equipment. Everything worked well, the sound was good, the internet cooperated. It's like, <laughs> it's like panel for a wedding <laughs> and on the day of the anniversary, the bride ran away. <laughs> In all the various practices, the internet was perfect. <laughs> the noise was perfect. And on, on the day we want to, to interview the president, the, the, voter, the dam <laughs> refused to supply water. <laughs> <laughs> the president is back on listening to you, Tony. So he hears you now. <laughs> so thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the audience can they can clap, but you won't be 